I feel we need a depth. The reason I came tonight is I was hoping you would be one brave Republican. Step away from your party and tell the seniors, let's not mess with our seniors, tell the seniors there's no death panel. I have a living will. I'm a nurse. I've witnessed living wills. There is a box on living wills. You can check, do everything. I know you're going to vote against it, that's, that's your thing, but just tell the seniors not to worry they're going to be put to death. Can you step away from your party and say, the living will has a box you can say, do everything. Just let's, don't scare the old people. And actually, I go through this clause that has caused so much uh, consternation. Um, and illustrate um, one of the uh, challenges. Uh, uh, I'm on the Indian Labor Committee. We've already voted. We've already uh, kept this in all night and, and jammed it. Uh, uh, so we debated in the middle of the night, so you probably didn't see a lot of debate on this clause and, and others. Uh, I had to read the bill as we were going through it, and I read the bill. But let me illustrate one challenge. Uh, the Section in dispute is Section 1233, Advanced Care Planning Consultation, A, Medicare, 1, in general, Section 1861 of the Social Security Act, 42 U.S.C. 1395X, is amended, A, in subsection S, 2, I, by striking, and, at the end of subparagraph, D, D, I, I, by adding, and, at the end of subparagraph, E, E, and I, 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 and it, it, a fair amount of that uh, goes on. That is basically a setup for saying that unless you understand what you're inserting into, you don't understand the, the, the basic section. And these sections here, the DDEE, FF, uh, HHH, and so on, are basically voluntary things, not mandatory things. So the, the legal presumption would be that what they're putting in here is a voluntary, not a mandatory. However, then it says, HHS, one, subject to paragraphs three and four, the term, quote, advanced care planning consultation means a consultation between the individual and a practitioner described in paragraph two regarding advanced care planning if, subject to paragraph three, the involved has not had such a consultation within the last five years. Such a consultation shall include the following, then it lists. Now, interestingly, they're inserting a mandatory into a voluntary. So that it is incorrect for either side, honestly, to assert that it's either mandatory or voluntarily because this is incredibly poorly written. And that's why you can hear some of the contradictions going back and forth. But it is not, and it also is the only consultation. Everything else is like a liver transplant if you need a kidney. Um, and so they're talking in that terms, and here all of a sudden it's about a, a consultation that um, uh, uh, is, is to be within the last uh, five years, which sounds mandatory. Then it says that uh, in E, an explanation by the practitioner of the continuum of end-of-life services. Now, the key thing here is, is that, uh, uh, honestly, I support hospice care. People differ from others, but when you face these decisions in your family, that should be something that's a voluntary decision in a living will as to how you do it. The question here is really assisted suicide. Uh, and that clearly, clearly, it, end of life services is end of life services, and it says all end of life services. That in the in the, it, but if that is not mandatory. Anybody who suggests it's mandatory, it's not mandatory. The consultation appears to be mandatory, but the choices are individual. They're not mandatory. Now the challenge here is, is they're Medicare reimbursed. So that this bill does pay for it. So it is inaccurate and quote, it's just a flat lie for people to claim that the consultation isn't paid for, it's Medicare reimbursed. It's not clear whether the services are reimbursed. So it would be incorrect to say that this bill mandates that whatever services such as assisted suicide is paid for because that's unclear. What it says is a consultation is reimbursement. Now, when you get into this, here's where the dispute gets even deeper. And that is, if you as, uh, and there's all sorts of other, uh, for example, it says if there's a significant change in the health condition of the individual, this gets in, uh, such as life-limiting disease, life-threatening terminal 
pneumoconiosis or life-threatening injury. Now, the reason this comes up is, was that every five years or just once? Because it says, so it appears to be just once, but if any of these things happen, does it become regular? Does each one constitute another required visit? Uh, I would suggest that looking at law precedent and how bills are written, that this suggests that it's, it's five years and then every time any of these other things, admission to a skilled nursing facility, terminal diagnosis, life-threatening injury, life-threatening disease, uh, chronic, progressive, any of those things can trigger another consultation, whether it's five years or not. Um, that's clearly the way the bill's written. That's not an opinion. Now here's where the opinion comes. Do you believe that this bill will push ration? I believe it pushes ration. Yeah. Now, yeah. We've got this yeah. that uh, what we don't have rationing right now, which you can argue is good or bad, is of hearts. We don't have rationing of kidneys. We have rationing of what kind of medications you get, but life-threatening that you have a, a right to be covered. And this was a huge dispute. Terry Schiavo's case is a classic example. At what point do you economically ration? When does the state, how long does the state keep you alive involuntarily? Uh, what about if it's a family dispute? That was a classic American case. But right now, even though we have economic rationing in most health care, it is not as much as here. Now, here's why I think that it promotes rationing. One is, the savings are, uh, the figures I think 800 million from uh, Medicare is saved. How are they saved? Well, the President has stated, and in the, the uh, uh, 500 billion in Medicare is, is for the savings of this bill, because most costs occur at the end of your life, whether quite frankly you're seven or elder, it makes sense, the biggest cost is at the end of your life. Now, if you're gonna save money at the end of your life, how do you propose to do this? Now, you're going to run the continuum of services in front of it. My guess is that most people would choose hospice care, uh, not assisted suicide. The question is, if that's one of the options, do we get into that option? But, if they restrict, which is the presumption here, you have a, co a consultation, basically lays it out for Then you have another consultation when you find out it's chronic and progressive. You have another consultation as you enter a nursing home. How does this discussion go? You're not going to get another heart. You're not going to get enough liver. Your pain's going to increase. It's going to take the money away from your family. The preponderance of push will be to change people's behavior, or they can't save 500 billion. So it is completely ridiculous, as John Stewart and others have said, to try to argue that there isn't an end of care, uh, isn't an end of care, uh, and that this doesn't push likely push people into decisions at the end of life that are different than before. But we need to be more precise because it isn't clear that it's mandated suicide or that they're going to mandate anyone that they have to. But the, they're, they're involuntarily, in my opinion, setting the table such they're going to push people that way. And even in many cases, if you feel like you don't have, even if you're not, you don't have to, you feel like the pressure is coming down on you. And that's why and where we have uh, the disagreement. And quite frankly, uh, you may not agree with that on the, on the rationing, but that's where it's coming from. But there has been a lot of misinformation claiming this isn't in the bill. If it wasn't in the bill, why have the Democrats promised to take it out? And why did Senator Grassley say he was going to take it out? <laughs> from Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, Congressman Souter, I want to know just a simple question. Yes or no, I just want a yes or no answer. Will you uphold and defend the U.S. Constitution, Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, even if it's at the peril of your political career? Uh, yes, I always defend it.